Galatians 5, verse 13. Christian liberty. It's like the liberty that we have in this country. The liberty that we have in this country, our founding fathers. You guys study American history. If you've never studied American history, you're missing, you're missing it. There are things, I was taught American history in school, but I never heard the deep religious Christian principles that our nation was founded on. If you have never read what the men who settled this country, now I'm talking from the 1600s on, if you've never read the things that those men said, you're missing what America really is. You're missing it. And when they were writing the Constitution, guys like John Adams, they would write letters. And in these letters, they would describe and discuss what they were doing and why they were doing it. And they said that the Constitution was written specifically for a moral people. A people who could govern themselves. And it's biblical. Those who can govern themselves do not need someone standing over them, telling them what to do over the time. When we had a Christian school here, we were running the ACE program, and I liked it. Because what it did was it allowed those students who wanted to excel, it allowed them the opportunity to do that. We had a young, the, one of the best students we ever had here. Uh, her family were good friends of ours uh, from a church down south. We had known them for years. In fact, her grandpa was Earl Ames, one of my favorite old preachers. And she would come in here every day. She would set higher goals than what she had to every day. She would get done usually by one o'clock every day. In fact, she finished her high school courses a year ahead of time. She graduated early. And that program allowed you to do that. And she was one of the best that I ever saw at that. And that program allowed her to excel. We didn't have to stand over her. We didn't have to make sure she did everything right. We didn't have to watchdog her. We didn't have to follow her around here to make sure she was causing, wasn't causing trouble. Never had to, and we had a bunch of students like that. But then we had some that I, call, I called them Old Testament. The difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament students, we had to look at every assignment they did, every page they did, every question they answered. We had to make sure they weren't cheating because they were constantly cheating. We had to follow them around. We had to make sure that they weren't going to get in any trouble because nine times out of ten, they were going to break the rules. They complained about that. They complained because they didn't want somebody watching over this, mainly teenagers. And they complained about it because they didn't want anybody watching them all the time. Well, if you don't want somebody watching you all the time, then don't act in such a way as what compels it. And this anti-law and anti-police sentiment in this country, I guarantee you, it has nothing to do with liberty. It has everything to do with, I want to rape, pillage, do drugs, and steal without having any consequences for it. It is a generation of children who were never punished as children, who were taught that they can get by with whatever they want to, and that they have a right to everybody else's stuff. They're living communal style there in the middle of Seattle. And I don't know if you I've been to Seattle one time, never want to go back. I saw enough liberalism there for a whole lifetime. It doesn't surprise me that it's happening there. But you see, what's happened is we have taken the, the mindset of most Americans, I won't say most Americans, I'll say some Americans. It's taken this idea of liberty to say that I get to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, to whom I want to do it, and you can't tell me any different. That's not liberty. It's not. It's a type of bondage that they don't understand they're in. You remember the days when you were in sin? Tell me, were you free? Were you free? Was anybody free? No, you're not free as long as you're obeying sin. You are in the worst kind of bondage there is. Now, I'm going to preach this morning about what I see going on in this country. There's, and it's all scripture. Some people ask, why is God allowing this to go on? 
God allows sin always to manifest itself. When you got saved, when you finally turned to the Lord, it wasn't at the beginning of your life of sin. It was at the end of it where you couldn't take it anymore. That's when you asked Jesus to come and save you and to help you. Amen? So sin has to run its course with people before they wake up and realize, I can't do this anymore. As long as we're enjoying it and as long as we're getting away with it, we'll never ask for help. As long as drugs are free and as long as drugs are fun and as long as drugs uh, make you act crazy and you can get by with it, as long as alcohol does the same, as long as anything like that has that effect on you, you will never stop and ask for help. It has to run its course. Then you want help. And this is what we're, we're seeing sin run its awful course in this country. Preachers warned about it years ago, and it's happening now. So, Galatians 5, verse 13. Paul said, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. So, the question is, are you here this morning because you were compelled to come to church or you're going to lose your salvation? Is that why you came? No, you're here because you want to be here. Why do you read your Bible? Out of compulsion? Is it an order? Does someone make you read your Bible? Do you do it voluntarily? You do it voluntarily. You do it on your own. Does someone make you tithe? No, you do it voluntarily. Some churches, there are some churches who will tax you. They will compel you to tithe. They will demand that you show them how much money you make a year and they demand their 10% or you're not a member and you'll lose your membership. I'm not making that up. That's wicked. That's wicked. If you don't, if you don't want to give, don't. Amen. But when you're right with God, I'm going to show you another picture today of a woman that I hope she lives. But we found somebody else in Turkana that was near death because she hadn't eaten in over a week. The food that we brought to her, the guys at our station had to sort of, they had to cook it for her and make like a, I don't know, like a slurry, like, like malt meal just for her to be able to get it down. We hope she lives. We hope she lives. The people who gave for that, I didn't tell them to do that. Go back and listen to every sermon I've ever preached, how many times I've ever asked for money. But people gave because they wanted to give. They knew it was the right thing to do. So we've been called to liberty. You either do right because you want to do right, or you don't have the heart that you think you have. Amen? But, he says... Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Liberty is not a license for you to sin. The liberty that we have been given as Christians. Yeah, we, we eat pork. We eat pork. We don't do the Passover. Christ is our Passover. We don't practice the laws that they practice in the Old Testament. We've been given liberty. And yet, I would dare say that more than likely, practically all of us have on occasion used liberty as a license to sin. And Paul said it ain't right. He said, but by love serve one another. So what is, what is, what were those Ten Commandments about? The Ten Commandments were about, number one, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? Number two, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Because if you love your neighbor, if you love your neighbor, you won't be sleeping with his wife. Amen? If you love your neighbor, you won't steal his stuff. If you love your neighbor, you won't covet what he has. If you love your neighbor, you won't lie to him. You won't kill him. That's what those commandments are about, that they are fulfilled. They literally are fulfilled in love one another or love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So any sin that you commit is literally 
either A, a sin against your neighbor, or B, worse, a sin against your own body, which fornication is. So he says, verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Now, I want to use what's going on right now. How long, let's say that Trump and the government does not intervene in Seattle. How long do you think that communal lifestyle is going to last up there? It's never lasted anywhere. They keep trying it. They keep rehashing it. They keep calling it different things. But it won't last. It's okay as long as you can sleep with somebody else's girlfriend. But wait till some guy grabs yours. What are you going to do? You kill him. So they are, they're hypocrites in every sense of the word. It's okay as long as they're taking somebody else's stuff. But if somebody comes to take theirs, they'll kill them. It happened in the 60s. It'll happen now. It won't be long before that group that's taken over Seattle will devour themselves. I saw it. What are they doing? They're devouring their own selves. They burnt down their own neighborhood Wendy's. They burn it down. Who works there? Their own people work there. They just destroyed their jobs and their livelihood and their hamburgers. They destroyed their own. Doesn't make sense. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does it mean to walk in the spirit? I'll show it to you in a minute. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. When I was in Bible college, I did a term paper on the book of Galatians. And I dare say that I understood it then the way I understand it now. And I think I probably got a 95. I was good at writing term papers. Very good at it. Um, but I dare say that I understood Galatians back then, being 19, 20 years old, the way I understand it now, being 54. I understand it a lot better with age and experience. I understand better that there are two natures in me. One is a nature that never wants to disobey God. It never wants to sin. It never wants to hurt another human being as long as I live. And then there's the nature that hurts everybody I know. And I hate that guy. I hate him. The flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to another so that you can't listen to this. You cannot do the things you and I want you to look in your Bible and I want you to under, underline the word would. W-O-U-L-D. Underline that word. Because here's what it is. You heard the verse that said, For if we sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You heard that verse, right? I can't remember right now where it is. I was going to put it in my notes last night, but I was too tired. If, you, if we sin willfully, and people have asked me about that verse, well... Pastor Mike, any sin that I do, I mean, I did it willfully. I mean, I did it knowing I was doing it, right? Here's what your will is. Your will, if you are saved, if you're born again, you have the Spirit of God in you. Your will is that you never do anything wrong ever again. Am I right on that? Am I right on that? Do you ever want to hurt anybody else ever again? Do you ever want to sin again? No, that's your will. That's what you really are now that you're saved. So think about then what that verse says. If we sin willfully, it means that our will 
our deepest desire is that, yes, we want to go back into sin. We want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We want to turn our back on God. And I'm going to show you that. Remember that word, would. Verse 18, but if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, something I always, always like to tell people when they're thinking about the Spirit. The Spirit and the Word of God are the same. You believe that? The Spirit is the Word of God. The Word of God, as Jesus said, um, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So look at this now. Look at, look at verse 16 and read down again. This I say, walk in the Spirit, the Word of God. If you walk according to the Word of God, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, the Word of God, the Spirit, and the Spirit. And this, by the way, the Spirit is never, ever, ever going to lead you against what's in the Scripture. They always are in perfect agreement with one another. And the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another. So you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. I love this Bible. Amen. I love it. I love what it says. I love what it does. It certainly does in me what I cannot do myself. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. You remember, he's going to pray in the garden. And Jesus is going to agonize there. And he's going to agonize so bad over what he's going to ha what's going to happen the next day that the Bible says drops of blood were coming out of his sweat glands. He was just agonizing so bad that blood was coming out. And so he saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, who are, I think, James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. As I would, if I knew I was going to hang on the cross next day, I guarantee I wouldn't be partying. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And this is what he told his disciples, which is us. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, let's listen to our Savior. Listen to God here. Our God is saying, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, as, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. Would you be? Sure you would. Sure you would. Findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. And look what he said. This, here's our Savior knowing this. Because he came down here and lived his life. The spirit in, indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And who knew more about the flesh and its condition than our Savior Jesus Christ? If his flesh wasn't if his flesh had no part in it, he would not have been sorrowful about what was going to happen the next day. He knew the next day he's going to liberate all the captives. He's going to set all men free. He's going to save sinners by the millions the next day. What a joyful thing the cross is to us. But Jesus had a flesh body just like ours. And he knew it was weak. The spirit's willing. Flesh ain't having it. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Well, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. You don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. I want you to look ahead the next few months in this country. What do you see? A lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. I'd just soon not go through it. Do I have a choice? Wherever God drags us, we're being dragged. Wherever he takes us. So I read this morning. I got up early and I read 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. So I look ahead and I see doom, gloom, trouble, and I see some pretty bad stuff coming. Is not God still God? Does he not still care for his people? He'll never stop doing that. Never. Now, turn to Romans 7. Remember that word would? Remember that word? We're going to see it. Romans 7. We're going to see it played out here. What Paul said in Galatians 5 he says, he, it's a double witness here in Romans 7. Romans 7 was probably the best chapter I ever read at understanding me. Because there would be times, I'd just during the course of the day, I'd be down here at the altar just crying. God, what is wrong with me? God, I can't. I can't live like this. God, I, I want to be different. And God taught me Romans 7. I got a dual nature in me. And it's going to stay that way until this body is gone. It'll never be different, ever. So Romans 7 is the key. Romans 7 verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Remember what we just said about the spirit. It's the word of God, isn't it? The law is spiritual. But I am carnal. Now listen to this. Paul is without a doubt the greatest Christian, the greatest evangelist, the greatest preacher, the greatest theologian, the greatest church planner that ever lived. And look at what he said. I am carnal. I am present tense and I had a lady call me years ago. She heard me on a radio station. She chewed me out about, if you're a Christian, you don't sin anymore. I said, man, where'd you get that from? She said, well, I don't sin. I said, you're lying to me right now. And I said, Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. He didn't say, oh, wretched man I used to be. He didn't say it past tense. He said it, I am right now, wicked. That conversation didn't last long. So look at what he said in verse 15. See that, remember, see that, look for the word would here. Look for the word would in verse 15. See it? Look at what he said. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Who agrees with that? Who says amen to that? You do it. And you don't know how to stop. If you knew how to stop, you'd have done it already. I mean, is your, is your life not better than it was back when you were in sin? Sure it is. There are things you're just not doing anymore. But are you perfect? Not a chance. Not a chance. So he says, but what I hate, that do I. If then... I, verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, that's your will, that's your will, I consent under the law that it is good. Is it not good to not steal? Is it not good to not kill? Is it not good to not commit adultery? Is it not good to do those things? Of course, we consent because we don't want to do those things. We're saying the law is good. And all this garbage, people say, well, we're not under the law anymore. That, to me, when people say that to me, that's an excuse for their disobedience. They're disobedient to God, and they want to give an excuse for it. They want to use liberty as a license to sin. So, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul didn't have it purged. It wasn't completely gone out of him. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Nothing good is in your flesh. And I used this illustration before, but name something that your body produces 
that doesn't stink. Not a thing. There's nothing that comes out of me. My pores, my mouth, my nostrils, or anything else that doesn't stink. It's corrupt. My body corrupts everything. Amen? That's you. That, and I think God did that as a testimony to us. We have to mask and clean and cover up and perfume everything about us because we stink. We're wicked. In my flesh dwells new good thing. For to will, here's, you know, now he's going to use the word will. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, there's that word again, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, will, that's your will, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This is the Apostle Paul saying this. So now he says, verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Present tense, right now. Evil's present with us. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now he's going to teach you the difference. Your will as a Christian resides in the new man that's in you. The inward man, the hidden man, the new man it's called, given by all these names. But your sin nature resides in the old man, the outer man, the corrupt man. And as long as, and he gives the illustration at the very beginning of Romans 7 of a woman married to a man. And he said, as long as she's, as long as that man is alive, she's married to him. She's bound to him by the law as long as he lives. So if she goes out and marries another, she's an adulterer, right? So he says, but if that man dies, now she's free to marry another. And then he takes it and he says, you, you, that's you. You, as long as your flesh lives, are bound to that flesh until that flesh dies. And once that flesh dies, now you're free to marry another. Who, who is that other? It's Jesus. Amen? And I, we have a, a... I love this example of Abigail in 1 Samuel 25. She's married to Nabal, who's a jerk, a moron, a fool. An abrasive, rough, sinful, arrogant, and lots of other words that I can't use in church. That's him, right? She's married to him. She's stuck to him. And he makes David angry, and David's going to go kill everybody in Nabal's house with 400 soldiers, all carrying swords, right? So Abigail, what does she do? Abigail's your soul. Abigail goes to David bearing gifts, falls down before him, prays to him and says, please, don't kill him. I know, I know what kind of man he is, but don't, because if you kill me, him, you're going to have to kill me too, and I don't want that. You know what she is? She is your soul begging for salvation. And what does David do? Put his sword back in his sheath, and he said, you got me. You just saved me from committing a great sin. I'll spare all of you. So what happened? She goes back. Nabal's drunk. He's giving a party for himself. What a jerk, right? What a jerk. He's giving himself a party. And so she waits till the next morning when the liquor is gone. And then she says, I went to see David. And I asked him to save us. And Nabal, boom, the Bible says he turned to stone. More than likely he had a stroke right then and there. Upon hearing that, he turned to stone for 10 days. How many commandments are there, Brother George? 10. And at the end of 10 days, he dies. Now she's free. And guess who she gets married to? David. 
her Savior, the shepherd, the king. Beautiful story. There is a picture of every doctrine in your Bible, if you'll look for it. God draws it all out for us and explains it to us, like in Romans 7. I love that. So, uh, verse 22 again. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am. Present tense. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. And it's why your flesh will never leave this earth. And God doesn't want it. And I don't want it either. Turn to Romans 8 now. Now he's going to give you the, the other half of it. Romans 8, verse 1. There's a lot of verses here. I probably won't have time. but So he says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Whereas before you were in sin, you were sitting in the seat of condemnation. You were in the judgment seat. And there was a trial. And everybody came out to testify against you. Adam comes. He's the son of mine. He's a sinner. He's, a, he's my son. He's a sinner. Your conscience shows up. Your conscience always testifies against you, doesn't it? It's what the Bible says. Your conscience says, I was with him when he did all of those things that are written in them books there. I was with him. I saw every one of them. I can give you all the details. And if he tries to lie, I'll bear witness against him. That's what your conscience does. Moses shows up. Moses. Bring your law. Moses, bring your law in here. Is this man, did he break these laws? He broke every one of them as far as I can tell. He's condemned. So what happens? Christ then takes us out of the seat of condemnation. Sits us in heavenly places. He then takes our place and is condemned for us in our place. So that we no longer are under condemnation people that ought to make you happy i don't know what it takes to make you people happy i've been trying for 20 some odd years but that ought to make you happy there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk not after what the flesh but after the spirit the word of god for the law of the spirit see there he says it law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Even though you still have a sin nature. He's going to make you free one of these days. Is God done in your life? Is God done working in your life? No. A thousand times no. He who hath begun a good work in you will continue it. He'll finish it. He'll make sure the job gets done, won't he? Uh, the Bible talks about receiving the end of your faith. The end of your faith is the end of your life. And that life you trust in Jesus every day of your life until the day he calls you home to be in heaven. Then will you need faith anymore? No, faith has become sight. But the Bible talks about receiving the end of your faith. Uh, verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. I and mean, I'm sure there's a law that all of those people in Antifa are breaking right now in downtown Seattle, right? I'm sure there's a thousand laws that they're breaking. Did it stop them? And Cubby, is it possible to stop people breaking the law if there's no law enforcement? not possible when they say we're going to defund the police you know some of these people are dead serious about that they mean what they say get rid of all the police get rid of them and have social workers you know what that is that's the civics version of time out let's sit in time out now let's counsel you about your choices that you made you killed 14 people you raped a child but let's talk about how we can make you a better person. 
Tell me if that's going to work or not. It won't work. But that's their plan. Doubt it not. That's their plan. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Where is sin? In your flesh. When's he going to condemn it? As he's killing you. He's going to condemn it as he's killing you. As he's taking your last breath away from you, he is going to condemn sin in your flesh. Um, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And see, this is what the Jews can't figure out. The Jews have told themselves for thousands of years that keeping the law of Moses will justify them before God. And they don't understand the Gentile way that we who have not obeyed the law yet are now justified before God freely by faith. And the Jews lack faith. They have abundance of works. They lack faith. They trust in themselves and in their Torah and in their understanding and in their Kabbalah and everything else, but they lack faith. And as long as they lack faith, they will never understand Jesus Christ and his way of the cross. They'll never understand it. One of these days, God's going to lift the veil and they're going to see it. But for right now, there's a veil over them and they can't understand it. So verse five, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Hence, you are here this morning. You're watching online. And I say again, I commend all of you who come and I commend you, especially you people online for being as faithful as you are, because I'm not sure that I could do what you do. You come to church every service in your home, no matter where you are, you come to service, you're there, you're faithful, and I commend you for that. And you're not here out of commandment. You're not here out of strict obedience. You're here because you want to be here. You're minding the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to be carly minded is death. We all know that. We lived it. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject, read this now, it is not subject to the law. Neither indeed can be. Your carnal flesh never obeys God. It never did and it never will. Who taught you how to sin? No one. It was born into you, bred into you. It's in your DNA. It's in your nature. Uh, verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, in the Word of God. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you the spirit dwells in you so does the word thy word have i hid in my heart that i might not sin against god you're saying the same thing when you say the spirit and the word dwelling inside of you now if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of his verse 10 and if christ be in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So, Brother George, you were reading 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, number one, defines the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It then talks about that Christ must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And what is the last enemy that shall be destroyed? Death. And if you actually, if you look in the book of Revelation, it actually turns out to be that way. Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. It's the last thing to be cast into the lake of fire. The last enemy that shall be, how did Paul know that? Holy Spirit told him. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Um... Let's see here. Verse 10. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of the sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up. Here's what I was going to say. Then 1 Corinthians 15 moves into I, 
teaching us about the resurrection. We planted, this year we planted some cucumbers, we planted some radishes, we planted some tomatoes, and some bell peppers. We had to replant the bell peppers. The deer ate one, and I chopped the other one down accidentally. It's a hoe. I'm a lo- I am not my father. My father was an excellent gardener. I'm lousy at it. But we got them out there, and they're growing. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the seed that we put in the ground doesn't look anything like what came out of the ground, does it? No. See what that's telling you? What is buried at your funeral bears no resemblance whatsoever to what's going to rise up out of that grave at the resurrection. Amen? He that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And Paul used the illustration of a seed. You plant the seed in the ground, the seed rises up, There's bodies terrestrial, there's bodies celestial, and every kind of body has its own nature, has its own thing. And then he says, oh, can't say it. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump shall sound and we shall be raised, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. I can't remember the rest. I'm like, I'm like Joe Biden. You know the thing. That guy, he's got to lose. Amen? He's got to lose. Anyway, so you have a dual nature, and you always will. Always will. Until you die. Then you're finally going to be free. I still plan on, at some point, preaching about death. It's not something I'm looking forward to, but at some point, we all have to face our own death. And right now, I'm afraid of it. But I've asked God that when it is my time, I don't want to be afraid. And I believe that I won't be. Because at that moment... I am going to be free. And I want that. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you, dear God, for helping us and for teaching us. Give us understanding, Father, of what we've read in your word. May the Spirit, uh, Father, give light to us so we can understand the natures that we have that dwell in us, that war against one another. Help us, dear God, to understand To live to be free is our common goal. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.